fabulously fabulous, marvelously marvelous, wonderfully wonderful, science fiction, theater of the imagination, proudly presents Extreme Gravity, the new radio play written by J.D. Evans Jr., starring Elvis D. Tripp and his traveling troupe of strange voices, and featuring the musical stylings of Milford Whittle and his finger puppet marching band, with Sue Esponte, silly announcements by Warpole the Potato. We continue with Chapter 14, A Murder of Clowns and Babblers. Bakra and Suzanne were watching on their remote viewing screen as Professor Darkstone began exploring the Slammer clown ship. They designed and built the remote viewing screen, RVS, with help from the ship's artificial intelligence bot, Psy, after discovering the various capabilities of the Dros when they explored the stone castle and abandoned city before they took a ride in the 1960 Ford Thunderbird space tunnel ship and met Ogly Nogly. The RVS worked the same way as the fourth dimension drive-in movie screen and there was a similar set of controls to select the desired scene or location to view. One of the Brainos, who was a Sabre collaborator, told Bakker and Suzanne about Professor Darkstone's plan to surveil the Slammer's clown ship, and this piqued Bakker's and Suzanne's curiosity. Few people had seen the inside of a Slammer clown ship, and there was considerable mystery and speculation regarding what it might contain or how it was used as a psychological weapon by the grand eye of Toe and his slammers and clowns as they strove to enlist more planets in the fight to extend the generally accepted standard galactic week by precisely one day, thereby making it nine days, which everyone knows is evenly divisible by three. Professor Darkstone was traveling in an invisible and quite stealthy drone ship and was surprised by the first room or area in the slammer clown ship being a large cavern devoid of everything. No slammers, no clowns, no furniture, no machines, and nothing else. Just a empty cavern. The cavern had a smooth floor and since the cavern was empty, Professor Darkstone tested the environment and determined it was suitable for humans. So he parked his invisible stealth drone ship and decided to go for a walk to explore the empty cavern. As Professor Darkstone walked around the empty cavern, he began noticing shadowy gray dots following him. And since they had a friendly and comforting behavior, he surmised they might be protectors like the ones at the stone castle. When he had this thought, a few of the protectors flashed a short pattern of lights to confirm Professor Darkstone's intuition. Professor Darkstone continued exploring the empty cavern, and after a while the protectors flashed a series of warning lights and then completely surrounded Professor Darkstone to cloak him. A few seconds later, a smaller slammer clown ship teleported into the empty cavern and a contingent of clowns disembarked and formed a line that in a surreal way resembled a Brazilian conga line, after which the clowns started dancing. Around this time, a large door appeared at the far wall of the empty cavern, and after it slowly opened, the grand eye of Tole and his entourage entered the empty cavern to the accompaniment of blaring trumpets and a small kazoo band. The clowns stopped dancing and immediately started honking their clown horns frantically. Something was afoot, but what it was appeared to be a mystery. Professor Darkstone, as well as Bakker and Suzanne, were baffled and more than a tiny bit intrigued, even though at present they did not know 
each other were witnessing this in real time. As apparently was customary, a Pilatus strode to the front of the Grand Eye of Tolle's on the rise and began playing a solo of melodic proportion to begin announcing the Grand Eye of Tolle to the frantically honking clown. The Grand Eye of Tolle moved near the giant ball of string and made a simple statement. Grab your balls and hit the wings, cause it's two for Tuesday and every three game is free. The Grand Eye of Tolle abruptly turned around and walked back through the large sliding door, followed, of course, by his entourage of trumpeters, kazooists, and the single flautists. The clowns stopped honking their homework and grew suddenly quiet. Soon afterwards, the clowns marched back into their small, clamored clown ship and left the building as quickly as they had arrived. This made no sense whatever, but in odd way, it seemed to be something which was inevitable and was destined to occur. Now that the cavern once again was empty, the protectors uncloaked Professor Darkstone, who noticed something on the floor of the empty cavern near the location where the single flooded had performed the solo of melodic proportion. Professor Darkstone strode to the location of the object on the floor of the now empty cavern and after pondering what to do, reached down and retrieved it. Examining the object led Professor Darkstone to surmise the object was a coin. And on one side it had an iconic representation of a set of bowling pins. While on the other side there was writing in a strange symbolic language that appeared to be blah 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 blah. As this unusual sequence of events was happening, on a far distant planet, a babbler was providing moment-by-moment -moment reporting in the style of a mumbling golf announcer, covering the activities of Bakker and Suzanne, Professor Darkstone, and their protectors as if they were playing a round of most unusual golf. <laughs> Romunculus, the overlord of the 13th dimension, was an aficionado of golf announcing and found this to be very interesting, even though on many levels it made no actual sense. Romunculus resided in an extended Calabria brain and entertained himself by creating cyborg mermaids, playing water polo and watching golf tournaments. The current activities were entertaining, and whether it made sense in one way or another did not matter so much to Romunculus. Romunculus was very focused on determining what the Grand Eye of Tole, Slammers, and Clowns were planning to do. Since certain of their potential activities could have disastrous effects on the stability of the 13th dimension and the existence of Romunculus and his kind. The primary matter involved gravity, and this was the reason Romunculus also honored the gravity generator being built by Bakker and Suzanne on the asteroid. As far as Romunculus was concerned, the less everyone in the lower dimensions knew about the true nature of gravity, the better. Let them continue to believe gravity is the weakest force of all. Let them continue to believe gravity is the weakest force of all. Let them continue to believe gravity is the weakest force of all. This was the Romunculus Mantra. Professor Darkstone returned to the invisible drone ship and clicked a few controls that miniaturized the invisible drone ship and himself. Then he guided the invisible drone ship out of the now empty cavern and began exploring what appeared to be a maze of tunnels and walkways similar to what one might find in a submarine. There were slammers and clowns moving about, often frantically as if something important was going to happen. And after wandering through the maze of tunnels and walkways for a while, Professor Darkstone spotted a room that looked to be interesting what might be an important way. Inside the room, Professor Darkstone saw a murder of babblers having a rather intense conversation about something incoherent with an equal murder of clowns and a group of slammers, and noticed one of the clowns was wearing an official looking hat. <laughs>
often when the babbling subsided momentarily, the clown wearing the official looking hat was heard saying something that sounded like blah blah blah, blah blah blah, while honking its clown horn and pointing to a small model of a city replete with skyscrapers, trains, cars, and assorted greenery and shrubbery. When the clown did this, the babblers became excited and once again started babbling incoherently while the group of slammers appeared to be confused. The interaction between the official looking clown and the gaggle of babblers continued until an even more official looking clown entered the room and began dancing and honking its clown horn. As soon as this happened, everyone, including the group of clamors, began clapping. And yet another clown entered the room, pushing a cart, on which there was an elaborately decorated, large, multi-layer cake in an Art Deco style, on which the phrase, blah, 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 was written in licorice jelly beans. This made little, if any, sense to Professor Darkstone, and Parker and Suzanne, but it must have made sense to the clowns, slammers, and babblers, although it was unclear precisely why. Then, in a surprising and anticipated event, the top of the Art Deco cake blew off, and a cyborg mermaid stood up and announced Romunculus was going to make a small speech to the group. A hologram of Romunculus appeared. Gravity is not the weakest force. Many of your comrades will stop wearing underpants, and there will be much mirth abounding in the middle dimension. Romunculus instantly disappeared, and the cyborg mermaid made her own announcement to the group. On a far distant planet, Lola Waggy, who for the time being was not in her plant phase, lay near the Imperial Director and whispered in his ear, chapter of Extreme Gravity, A Murder of Clowns and Babblers. Stay tuned for the next chapter, The 13th Dimension. This has been brought to you by the fabulously fabulous, marvelously marvelous, wonderfully wonderful science fiction theater of the imagination. I'm Warful the Potato. Good